Hey there folks, Rel here, and welcome to Planetside 2, a free-to-play, massively multiplayer, first-person shooter where three factions wage war across multiple continents, and battles of 200 or more players is just another day at the office. This extensive walkthrough aims to help new players wrap their head around the general game flow, and offer up some helpful guidance along the way. We'll provide enough information to keep you from being cannon fodder, and get you started with developing your character. Each section will be divvied up using timestamps in the description below, in case you feel like skipping or coming back to a specific part, because this video definitely has a lot to talk about. If you don't already have an account, then you can use the link in the video description to grab a free starter kit with bonus items to help get you going. But if you already do have an account and you're just kind of new to the game, then this guide will help you make sense of the massive scale chaos that we call Planetside 2. So, first things first. There are three factions in Planetside 2, and they all have different strengths and design philosophies. The Terran Republic focuses on putting as many bullets downrange as possible. Most of their weapons fire quickly, they have the largest magazine sizes in the game, but tend to sacrifice reload speeds in exchange. In addition, their main battle tanks and Empire-specific fighters are the fastest in the game. The new conglomerate has some of the hardest hitting weapons in the game, but they also tend to fire the slowest, so you've got to make each shot count. While their weapons pack a punch from any range, they also specialize in close quarters combat with an emphasis on shields and shotguns. The Vanu Sovereignty is all about agility. Their high-tech weapons tend to be more accurate and reload more quickly than the other factions, but they tend to hold the middle ground in terms of rate of fire and damage. Their vehicles are extremely mobile thanks to maglev technology, and they also throw the best disco parties of any faction. After you've settled on which faction tickles your fancy, it's time to get started. When you create a character, there's an optional tutorial that will take you through some extreme basics, but after that you're kind of just thrown into the world without a whole lot to go on. Each faction owns one warp gate on every continent. Your warp gate is basically your safe zone. It's a great staging ground not only when you first log in, but is always available as a spawn point if you just need to back out of a battle and get reorganized. The first thing we're going to do is open our map and take a look at what's going on. The M key really is your best friend, as it's a massive source of information for every player. It may seem a little bit overwhelming at first, but we're going to take you through this nice and easy. Each faction's colors are represented on the map. Red for Terran Republic, blue for the new conglomerate, and purple for the Vanu Sovereignty. There are a variety of filters you can apply to change the way that data is represented visually, but you can always hover over a hex to give you information about what's going on there. Hovering over a hex will offer a rough numerical estimate of how many allies and enemies are in the area, as well as a pie chart showing off percentages of players from each faction. You can also see if important base defenses are offline, and how close attackers or defenders are to gaining or regaining control of the base. You may also see small explosions on the map, and this means that there is a substantial amount of combat taking place in that area. These locations are where your really big fights are usually taking place. The last icons that we want to be aware of are the attack and defense icons, and these may be placed by allied players leading squads or platoons. A shield icon means that the platoon leader is requesting reinforcements to defend the area, and if you see a targeting icon, that means that a platoon leader is requesting an attack on that specific location. These icons help entire factions coordinate their offensive and defensive strategies, so keep an eye out for them. Each hex on the map is connected by one or more lines, we call these lines lattice links, and these links point to which hexes are available to be attacked, and from where. As an example, we can see that the purple hex here, Sarava Biolab, is owned by the Vanu Sovereignty. It's connected by a yellow link to the red hex to the south, Sarava South Fortress, which is owned by the Terran Republic. As long as your base isn't being contested by enemy forces, shown by a countdown timer, you can assault the linked enemy base. In addition, these links show off the flow of resources coming out of territory and back to your warp gate. The three resource types control how many air vehicles, ground vehicles, and infantry assets you have available. When it comes to infantry assets, I'm talking about things like grenades, medical kits, landmines, and even the heavy mechanized armor called a max unit. If this is starting to sound a little bit complicated, don't worry. You'll understand the flow of the game the more you play, and your allies will be there to help you through it. That said, let's jump into some action and we'll revisit the map later on. Pressing the Instant Action key, or clicking the Instant Action button while the map is open, will initiate a countdown, and then it'll drop us into combat where our presence is required. The location that you'll be dropping into is also displayed on the countdown timer, so if you don't want to go to the Palisades in this case, or just want to know where that is, you can always cancel the countdown, open up the map again, and then reinitiate the countdown. If you hit the Instant Action button while the map is open, you'll automatically zoom into that location. 
The Palisade seems like a pretty good choice here. We control the outpost, the number of enemy to allied forces seems about even, but we're losing control. So let's drop in and help retake the base. Now stay with me here because I'm going to be throwing a lot of information at you pretty quickly. Every base has a spawn room, and a spawn room is a small, safe room where you can't be killed by enemy fire, and since we own this base, the spawn room belongs to us. In every spawn room you'll find an infantry console to rearm or switch classes, and some spawn rooms also have teleporters that will take you to other parts of the base. Generally, you don't want to stay confined in small rooms, as you're an easy target for enemy explosives, so keep on your feet and move smartly to flank your enemies. Allies are indicated by blue names and triangles above their head. In the case of this poor fella, a skull will indicate a player who is waiting to respawn. This guy right here is an infiltrator. You can always tell an infiltrator by their slim profile, oh, and the ability to use predator style invisibility. Infiltrators who are on your same faction will be highlighted in their faction color, but enemy infiltrators will be more difficult to spot as the light bends around them. Infiltrators are who you rely on to recon, snipe, hack enemy consoles, and even bust some heads in close quarters with the right weapons equipped. You can always pick out a combat medic by the white backpacks that they're wearing. Your medic is the guy who keeps you alive while under fire, picks you up and dusts you off when you do go down, and is also very effective both in close and at range as they are the only class who has access to assault rifles. As a little side note, medics are also the highest experience earning class in the game as long as they are being helpful, so if you're looking to get a leg up on the competition, the combat medic is a good class to play. Capture points are indicated by letters, and different bases have different amounts of capture points. The ones that don't belong to you will show up as the enemy faction's color, and that means that you need to go and reclaim it. When a capture point is blinking, like this one, that means that it's changing control. Standing on top of capture points and dealing with all the enemies nearby will allow you to flip a capture point into being under your own control. If you see people cruising through the sky with the aid of nifty little jetpacks, those are your light assault. Light Assaults use their mobility to overcome obstacles like walls surrounding a base or fighting from interesting angles that the enemy just doesn't expect, and they're especially useful when your aircraft is getting shot down and you just need to bail out. Elevators are helpful for getting to high places, like into this turret tower. The purple elevators are going to take you down and the yellow ones will take you up. And if you do manage to fall out of an elevator, you'll be immune to fall damage for a few seconds just after using one. Pressing your Q key while looking at an enemy will identify them for nearby allies. This will cause them to appear on the minimap and show a triangle above their head for a limited amount of time. Be careful though, as nearby enemies will also hear you yelling, and that's a really easy way to give away your current location. Sunderers are your major ground transports in Planetside 2. They're mounted with two weapon turrets, are heavily armored, can carry an entire squad of combatants, and can even act as a deployable spawn point and rearming station. These are high priority targets that need to be taken down as quickly as possible. That last grenade toss ended up hitting an ally, which you can see by the red no-no cross in the middle of the screen. Friendly fire is possible in Planet Side 2, and your weapons can even be disabled for a time if you do too much of it. The guy in my sights right now is called a Max Unit. Max Units are heavily armored suits that can be hard to deal with in one-on-one -on -one combat. They have an array of different weapons that allow them to specialize in anti-air, anti-vehicle, or anti-infantry roles, and they use two weapons at any given time, so they can either mix and match, or focus strongly in one area. It's important to use hard-hitting weapons against these guys, like the Heavy Assault's rocket launcher. Yeah. 
If you open your voice action menu by pressing the V key, you'll be able to say a few different things to players nearby. In this case, I'm requesting ammo from the nearby engineers. You have any spare ammo? Engineers along with combat medics are your two major support classes. Your engineers are going to keep your vehicles and your max units repaired, they can drop ammo packs, lay landmines, and even deploy turrets for their own personal use. Small arms fire can deal damage to smaller aircraft and vehicles. Even if you don't have a dedicated anti-air weapon, it's usually a good idea to try to put some damage on them when you can. It's always a good idea to keep an eye on your minimap so you can tell exactly what's going on around you. In this case, you'll notice a couple enemy tanks rolling in, and they're marked in the red and have distinct icons that let me know what type of vehicle they are. The icons here are showing the Vanu Sovereign's main battle tank, the Mag Rider, and I want to take him out. The last infantry class we have to talk about is the Heavy Assault. These are your main bullet sponges of the front line. They have access to personal overshields that make them tough to take down in a one-on-one -on -one situation, rocket launchers to drop enemy ground and air vehicles, as well as high-capacity light machine guns that lay down the hurt for long periods of time. And that's exactly what I'm talking about. Once the base is secured, you'll be notified by your commander, and then it's on to the next battle. We've successfully defended the facility. So now, let's take a step back and show you how to build up your character and your vehicles, so that you're more effective on the battlefield. As you move through the game, you're going to earn experience from various actions, either killing enemies or healing allies, repairing vehicles, dropping ammo, capturing bases, etc, etc. For every 250 experience gained, you'll earn a certification point, or CERT for short. The certs are the in-game currency you use to upgrade your character. At low levels, there are a couple different upgrades that can help you become leaps and bounds more effective on the battlefield than you previously would have been. If you press the escape key, we can select the infantry loadout menu and tinker with our classes. The first thing we're going to do is select the light assault class and invest in a suit slot to fill in one of the blanks. In this case, we're going to be clicking on that empty suit slot, then we're going to put a point into our flak armor. After it's upgraded, we're going to equip it in our suit slot by just clicking on it, and only one suit slot can be used on a specific loadout at any given time, but flak armor is an extremely powerful upgrade for beginners and veterans alike, thanks to how prevalent explosives are in Planetside 2. As you progress through the game, you can explore other options that will better fit your playstyle and swap out suit slots as you please. Most loadout options will be unlocked per class, with few exceptions. So even if we've unlocked Flak Armor on our Light Assault, we won't have access to it on our other classes unless we unlock it there as well. The next thing we're going to do is unlock a utility item to fill in that blank utility slot. But we are not going to click on the empty slot this time, instead we're going to click on this little button right here and view all of the certifications available to the class. If you've ever had a question about what a specific class or weapon has access to as far as upgrades or attachments, just open up this window and take a look. At the very top, you'll see that the medical kit and restoration kit are universal utility items. Universal means that as soon as you unlock them on any class, they're available to every class. So we're going to go ahead and unlock the medical kit, but if you don't have enough certs for it yet, then don't worry about it. Do try to make it one of your very first unlocks though, as it's going to save your life over and over again. Once we have it unlocked, we can go back and equip it the same way that we did with the flak armor, by just clicking on it. The last thing we're going to be looking at upgrading are the optics on our weapon. By default, your weapon is equipped with the standard iron sights, but you can upgrade them with various options depending on the weapon that you're using. In this case, we're going to unlock the 2x red dot sight, which is going to give us a little bit more magnification and a clearer view of our target without hindering us in close quarters combat. On the starting weapons, a few of the optics only cost 5 certs, but most will cost 30. We can do the same thing for our vehicles as well, but I'm not going to cover that in this episode. 
If you'd like to know more about a specific vehicle or weapons or attachments or anything else, then you can go to your warp gate, open up the Continent Travel Console, and check out the VR room. The virtual reality room will give you access to practically every toy in the game while you're in there. That said, let's touch on some general etiquette and rules of thumb, and then finish up with some squad play. Number one, don't shoot your teammates. They generally don't like that. Number two, don't be obnoxious over the voice comms. And as a pro tip, if you press the enter key on your number pad, you'll instantly mute whoever is talking or yelling or otherwise being annoying. Number three, help your teammates. If you're a medic, you heal others. If you're an engineer, you drop ammo and repair friendly vehicles. Number four, don't sit in the spawn room. It may seem like a good idea, but in reality, it contributes to a larger problem where people are basically missing opportunities to retake bases because they're too scared of dying to be useful. Number five, you're gonna die a lot. Planetside 2 is a game of scale. You can die in a hundred different ways at a moment's notice, but don't let that discourage you. One thing that helps with the not dying aspect of the game is getting a friend to watch your back. When you're starting out and just getting a feel for things, it's not a bad idea to play solo. Some people actually prefer it. But the real meat of Planetside 2 comes from outfits and squad play. Any player can join a squad either automatically by just pressing the insert key or by choosing a specific squad to join through the squad window. Generally, these squads have names that reflect their goals, which might be to attack a certain continent or complete a certain objective. When you're a part of a squad, you'll get a few helpful perks. The first of which is bonus experience for helping your squad. So if you're playing a medic or engineer and you're healing or repairing an ally who is also a squad member, you'll gain even more experience than you normally would have. The second perk is being able to drop into specific locations marked by a friendly squad beacon or spawn at the nearest base to your squad leader, regardless of where you are to begin with. A single squad can hold up to 12 players, but squads can also be part of larger groups called platoons, which can hold up to 4 squads at the same time. And squads and platoons come with specific chat channels that help you coordinate between team members. Squad and platoon waypoints will guide you to where your next objective is, as long as the squad or platoon leader is keeping them up to date. On top of squad play, you also have the option of joining an outfit. In other games, they're called guilds or clans. An outfit is a group of like-minded people, and usually they're willing to help out new players. The easiest way to find an outfit is through word of mouth or by visiting the outfit recruitment section of the Planetside 2 forums. I've included a link to the outfit recruitment forums as well as a bunch of other helpful resources in the video description. Planetside 2 is a truly massive game unlike any other, and it may take you a long time to fully grasp the flow of the game, but hopefully this walkthrough was a good stepping stone for you. If this video has been interesting, helpful, or entertaining, please feel free to like, subscribe, and tell your friends about the channel. And if you ever have a question or are just looking for advice, you can comment on any of my videos and the community will usually try to help you out. Thanks very much folks, we're all signing off.